This week on Wealth Track, they say the best things come in small packages, but great investor Charlie Dreyfus says the time to think big is now. The noted small company stock manager explains why he has closed his small cap fund to new investors and is open to large caps in his Royce Special Equity Multicap Fund. A rare interview with Charlie Dreyfus is next on Consuelo Mack Wealth Track. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairhome Foundation. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. They say the best things come in small packages, and that has certainly been the case in the stock market in recent years. Looking over the last decade, for instance, small company stocks have outperformed large company ones by a significant margin, delivering 10.4% annualized returns versus 7.1% returns for large cap ones. Last year, the performance gap was also huge. The Russell 2000 Index, considered the benchmark for small stocks, advanced 38.8%, whereas the widely followed S&P 500 lagged with a 32.4% return. And not only that, by several measures of value, including price earnings multiples, small stocks look expensive. Five years from the market's 2009 bottom and clearly in a bull market, where are the best stock bargains to be found? That is a question value investors ask themselves every day. However, few portfolio managers are interested or able to stray from their area of focus or expertise. This week's guest is an exception in both desire and ability. Three years ago, he made a decision to expand his longtime concentration in small company stocks to include large ones as well. He is great investor Charlie Dreyfus who for the last 16 years has made his name managing the Royce Special Equity Fund, which is a value-oriented small and micro-cap fund that has beaten its benchmark, the Russell 2000 Index, since inception with less than market volatility. In 2010, Dreyfus launched another value-oriented fund, but this one was not in small caps and never will be. It is the Royce Special Equity Multicap Fund, and it is emphasizing large-cap stocks right now. It has also beaten its benchmark, the Russell 1000, since its inception three years ago. Why did Dreyfus want to go big, and how did he convince his boss, legendary small cap pioneer and fund manager Chuck Royce, to let him do it? Dreyfus says although he was managing small, he always kept an eye on the big boys. Large caps did extremely well from 1982, August of 1982, into March of 2000. And uh, I think the S&P number is roughly about 18% compounded over that period of time. For 18 years and for 100 years, including that time period, it's roughly 9%, so it way overachieved. So it was sort of regression to the mean. This, even if the financial crisis hadn't happened, the likelihood of is those stocks were going to underperform. And th so you had the confluence of an asset class that was overvalued coming into the decade with some concerns. And particularly, you know, one of the concerns to this very day in these large stocks is their international exposure and specifically their emerging market exposure. This is used to be thought of as a positive. These days it's thought of as a negative. Um, so the valuations were attractive. I, I went, uh, I, I did some of my metrics to just sort of test and see uh, is my perception uh, substantiated by the figures? Ultimately, everything rests on the numbers. Okay? For you. For me. Yes. Right. So um, I, um, I went to Chuck and, to, and asked him if, um, what his thoughts were about us launching a large cap fund. I can imagine the reaction you got. Yeah, it wasn't positive. <laughs> uh, although he didn't rule it out entirely. He said, let's think about it. So uh, I 
I thought about it a couple of days and I went back to him and I said, well, how about this? If you have no problems and I go to compliance and they have no problem, would it be okay with you if I started buying some of these and did some real research from my own account? Mm -hmm. And he said, absolutely, fine, go do it. And it turned out I found names and I started making money. <laughs> and for your personal account. For my personal account. Right. In, with the, in with large the blessing, caps. With the blessing of the firm in right. large cap. And so I uh, went back to Chuck and I showed him, you know, the results. And I said, you know, the values are still there. But this is uh, two, uh, two, 2009 mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and um, early uh, 2010, we launched the fund December 31st, 2010, ultimately. Right. So This is the Royce Special Equity, Equity Multicap Fund. Fund, which just celebrated its third anniversary, therefore. And it's beaten the market. It's gotten great returns, three years. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, uh, yeah, three years is a short period of time, but we're encouraged by what we've seen. Um, so uh, I, I kept on working with Chuck and you know he kept on saying correctly so you know, remember we're a small cap shop and uh, largely and um, so we finally came up with a name for it uh, which is multi-cap it's not all cap multi-cap the distinction there is basically the lowest market cap area generally will be five billion dollars so Things below $5 billion will most often be excluded from the multi-cap portfolio, but it has no upper cap. So uh, it's a matter of public record. There are names in the portfolio such as uh, Microsoft and Intel with humongous. Very large cap. Very large caps. <laughs> so the, well, and there are some in the portfolio with you know, $5 to $15 billion mm -hmm. market caps. The average weighted one is in the $40 to $50 billion, which is still by most measures, large cap. But 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 why? It's, it was a valuation call. It was a valuation. You decided you're a small cap manager, has been for 15 years, and you've decided looking at the valuations that small caps had done well and large caps had lagged. So that was the, that was it was a macro call then, right? It, it was, but I also always uh, I take my responsibility as everyone at Royce does, and I'd like to believe most in our industry do. You know. I'm a fiduciary to my clients. And you know, whether it hurts my wallet or not, I have a duty to give them my best advice. Mm -hmm. And if that means suggesting that a different asset class is better, or if that means reducing our fees, or if that means shutting the product down, we have to do it. I should also mention we just, uh, on that basis, uh, we now have about $185 million in the multi-cap product, and I went to the board and asked them to reduce the fees. We, we reduced it from 100 basis point management fee to 85 basis points right. management fee recently, as, as of January 1, actually. Thank you. I mean, I, okay. I appreciate that as, as an investor. And, and, and I m might add along those same lines that the Royce Special um, Equity Fund, which is, is your small blend fund, uh, it, you closed it to investors in 2012. Two years ago. And, and the reason was? The capacity issue. I just couldn't find, I mean, we could take in more money, but it wouldn't serve the clients right. uh, good. It will, would help Royce and Charlie Dreyfus, but in the long run, it wouldn't really help Royce and Charlie Dreyfus because we would tarnish our reputation for being good stewards. Uh, it's the second time I actually closed my special equity small cap fund. And you know, it's the confluence of monies coming in, selling securities, and the, the, pro, the process that I use for multi-cap is the same process that I use for small cap. And part of that is quantitative and part of it is qualitative. The quantitative, the first and foremost is valuation. Rate of return is a function of entry level. And the math is the math. And you know, the market in general, not only uh, small stocks, large stocks also, it's elevated. Mm -hmm. there's, no, there's no arguing about that, okay? The point is, can it go higher? And I believe it can. Perhaps we'll have time to explore that. Well, let, let, so let's okay. talk about that. Let's talk about your outlook for the market, which uh, you turned 
really bullish well, about when? A year, about a year ago. A year, so, so what, in January, January of 2013? Correct. And, and, and why are you really bullish about the stock market and, and large caps in particular? Well, um, I was doing a marketing trip and I was speaking as I am with you. And as I'm doing the marketing trip, I get more and more bullish. And at the last meeting, I sort of yell out, this is a melt-up. I've seen this movie before. <laughs> and um, fortunately, because I'm known traditionally as being you know, ultra conservative, I think I shared with you, Chuck once gave me a portrait of myself wearing belts and suspenders. <laughs> I, I, I'm a cautious prove, individual. Right, prove it, right. <laughs> so um, the, um, I, there are several factors at work. Number one, Relative to the world, we're just in a great place. Um, we the have, U.S. is. The U.S. Right. is. We have uh, natural population growth. We have an abundance of everything, increasingly so. I mean, we all know about the energy renaissance and how we're going to be exporting uh, petroleum and lar probably the largest en energy producer in the world. Um, the manufacturing renaissance, the fact that we're reshoring, uh, companies coming back, but more importantly, case after case of foreign companies coming here. Uh, BASF, the old German chemical company, 150 years old, is moving chemical plants to the United States because the cost of natural gas is a third of what it is in Europe. Plus, the regulations are so much easier. The other thing is that we're a consumer economy, so having said all of this, our um, exports run 15% of our economy. We're not Germany, we're not Japan. We, yes, it's good to do exports, but if for some reason we couldn't, it wouldn't hurt us. And half of those exports, exports actually, are agricultural. So they're probably not at risk. And then there's another aspect of this, which, which you had talked to me about, that, that you have a, a, a theory that c the company's profitability as the economy improves, that their profitability can really accelerate. So, so what, is, what is that theory, which is it, it, yeah. a really long-term trend as far as you're concerned, could be? I've noticed of late that many companies, particularly in the industrial uh, sphere and sectors, are showing on flat or down revenues higher operating margins, percentage of earnings. And now there can be, the accountant in me is cynical enough to say, yes, well, we all know companies have not spent enough on capital expenditures, so depreciation, which would be included in those costs, are down, and so they're benefiting from that. Or because we're having so low inflation, which is also a cause for bullishness, incidentally, that low inflation, um, is aiding companies in the sense that they expected raw materials to cost more than they have, and so they're getting a pricing benefit. Mm -hmm. They've priced for higher costs and they're not a, a, having to expend for higher costs. And, but when I dig deeper, and what some people have described unique to me, and probably unique, therefore, in my multi-cap space, because I don't bring much else unique to my multi-cap space, is my deep dive right, into Right, your deep dive accounting, your accounting right. cynicism, but the deep dive into the, the numbers. numbers. Correct. Right. And the deep dive in the numbers, and this goes across asset classes. This occurs in small caps and, and large caps these days. But on the point we're talking about, uh, this incremental margins is a sign, if it's not due to those two factors that I've uh, mentioned, it's a sign that the cost structures changed, that the break-evens have been lowered, so that once we do start getting higher revenue, and the economy seems to be on traction, people, as we're speaking now, everyone's in the process of revising their thir fourth quarter real GDP. It's come right, up it's from, going up. It's going up. Right. It's, it's come from like 2% to 3% of late. Well, and you add up. Uh, 1% or 2% for inflation, you're starting to get some real nominal GDP. Once GDP goes above 5% nominally. Nominal, right, that's including inflation. inflation right. Then companies will probably have decent revenue growth and a good portion of that will fall down to earnings per share, profits. And what the market may be saying to us, yes, people, the market is elevated on current numbers, 
But looking out a, a couple of years, I don't know, is it two years? It's, it's, it's not, I doubt it's in 2014, okay? And therefore, frankly, I'm not willing to pay for it. Yeah. Um, you know, the numbers are the numbers I buy on reported earnings or lower future earnings. I don't prepay in either of my funds for future earnings. No, I think you said that, that you want to pay zero for expectations. Correct. Right. I want to crunch out expectations for my stocks because that's a way I'm trying to make my clients absolute money. And the way to do that is to buy absolute value. Give us some examples of where you're finding absolute value in the large cap space. Okay. Um, it, it often is in areas that are uh, unpopular. And that, that's true. I mean, I, I work in the area of anomalies, inefficiencies. And the, the first way to assess if, if a stock or a whole sector is out of fashion is to run a screen. Uh, I use, and at Royce we generally use, a valuation metric which uh, is a cap rate, the return the buyer would get if they bought the whole company. And I compare that to what I think my cost of capital would be. Again, as a private equity or a strategic buyer mm -hmm. would, there has to be a spread. There has to be, I have to earn more than it's costing me. So uh, these days, uh, retailing, mm -hmm. which there's a lot of controversy about, and retailing has been controversial now for a couple of years, but I keep on reminding people there's something unique in American DNA. We're shoppers, okay? and. Uh, we're, we're a consumption economy. So, so a, a, a company, for instance, that, that exemplifies, you know, the, the Royce and the Dreyfus approach, a retailer would be what, what company? That well, you in the own? large cap space, it would be um, Nordstrom. Nordstrom. Nordstrom, um, I think, is misunderstood or not fully appreciated. Uh, most people know of them for the service they provide in their stores and, you know, fashion. It's not a a full department store, you don't buy refrigerators at Nordstrom. But um, they have a somewhat of a, of a uh, niche, um, somewhat on the higher end level, of course, but what people have not given them credit for is, first of all, their earnings have been uh, under some pressure because they've developed a very robust multi-channel approach to retailing. They have this off-price uh, division called the Rack. They have uh, a lot of boutique kind of acquisitions they've made, which got them into more product, but more importantly, got them expertise in communicating with their customers. And they've, they, they've said publicly that, you know, they're somewhat concerned 50 years out whether people will be going to malls. Right. And so, they, they're on the cutting edge of all of this, and that's costly. And, uh, and on cutting edge of, of online shopping right. as well, that right. they're developing. Right. And, right, and the fact that you can buy it online, return it to the store. I mean, you know, just making it a seamless transaction, taking all of the negatives out of on online shopping. You're finding things in a Nordstrom, for instance, that you think your competitors are missing, and so the deep dive accounting shows you what? What I found, among other things, in... Um, Nordstrom was the fact that unique these days, it wasn't in the past, but unique these days is that Nordstrom, um, with total assets of eight, nine billion dollars, has over two billion dollars of credit card receivables that they own. In other words, if you have a charge account at Nordstrom, Nordstrom is carrying that and has to finance that. But it's a matter, again, of loyalty, closeness to the customer. You could go out if you wanted to and sell that portfolio. Obviously, you would get above par. You would get above the stated value because this is a very high quality portfolio that people would want. And they would get a servicing fee. They would get a, a residual, so to speak, off of those um, credit card receivables, even if they didn't own them, if they sold them to a third party. The right, so that, that's something that, that's that, something that, that I, I've seen. never seen people really mention. The other thing that people don't mention is that um, Nordstrom, which some retailers do uh, also, not, they're not totally unique on this, they own 
22 percent of their stores are on company are on company owned land and stores. So, so you've got the real estate real value estate, as well. Uh, well, now there's another significant portion where they own the store but not the land. They may have options to buy the land, but 22% of the portfolio, it's all theirs. There's a value, there's a, a comfort level, there's a, a, a financial anchor, as I describe it, that I don't think people really look at. And my experience is when you buy companies that have this um, absence of expectations, no one's hyping it. Quite the contrary, no one cares, okay? That's where the opportunity strikes. Not always, and not in every case. But in a portfolio, it seems to work out. Charlie, one of the things that, that we haven't talked about, and, and that is how important dividends are okay. um, in your process. Well, dividends are important. They've always been important. I actually did a, an academic paper many years ago, because if any asset that throws off more income everything else being equal is more valuable. And so what I have focused on in recent years are companies that uh, have a tendency and ability, that's the most important thing, the cash flow, the cash conversion cycle is such that they can raise their dividends with no fear of having to reduce them subsequently. And uh, the companies that do this over long periods of time are called dividend aristocrats. Uh, that's generally a term that's used for companies that do it a, more than 25 years or so. Um, and what I believe, and it's interesting, the, I, yields, these don't provide high yield. Most times it's an adequate yield, but it's not a high yield. So and it's a growing dividend it's stream a growing is dividend what you're stream. looking for, and right. And that's going to lead me to the next question, which is the one investment for a long-term diversified portfolio. So what is it that we should all own some of in our portfolios? Well, uh, and I'm going to mention a concept and then two names. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do personally own both of these two names, although I'm looking for more uh, venues, more, uh, a, more product that... Um, uh, offers the, this kind of yield that uh, I, I'm going to talk about. The, the two, these are uh, dividend growth ETFs. And the two that I uh, would like to highlight, uh, but I encourage your uh, viewers to do their own research and find some more, there are a lot of them, um, are the uh, Spider S&P. Dividend uh, ETF, right? Dividend ETF, it, the symbol is SDY. And the other is the Vanguard Dividend, Dividend Appreciation, VIG. Um, and both of them uh, you know, have decent yields. They're you know, constructed around an index, so there's little, if any, active management. But they, um, they have a history of owning the companies. There are, as of today, 18 companies in the United States that have raised their dividends for 50 years or greater consecutively. You can own them all if you don't do the deep dive into the accounting and if you're not cognizant of valuation. Right. So interestingly, with all of those caveats and uh, metrics that I use, I nonetheless, seven of those are in my multi-cap fund and one is in my small cap fund. Charlie, thank you so much for joining us on Wealth Track. Thanks, My Charlie. pleasure, I'd love to come back. At the close of every wealth track, we try to give you one suggestion to help you build and protect your wealth over the long term. This week's Action Point picks up on Charlie Dreyfus's theme of investing in companies that have a history of growing their dividends. It is invest in growing dividend streams. Historically, dividends have contributed at least 40% of stock returns. And as Dreyfus said, all other things considered, income makes an investment more valuable. There are many products available to participate in growing dividend stories. Dreyfus just recommended two ETFs, the Spider S&P Dividend ETF that holds all stocks in the S&P 1500 that have raised their dividends every year for the past 20 years. There are about 80 of them. And the Vanguard Dividend Appreciation Index ETF, which focuses on U.S. firms that have raised annual dividends for at least 10 years. 
Among the mutual funds specializing in dividend growers are two that come highly recommended by both Morningstar and Barron's. They are the Vanguard Dividend Growth Fund and the T. Rowe Price Dividend Growth Fund. It is worthwhile putting the power of increasing dividends to work in at least a portion of your portfolio. In the meantime, to see past shows and additional interviews done exclusively for our website's extra feature, please go to WealthTrack.com. And for those of you on Facebook and Twitter, we look forward to connecting with you. Have a great weekend and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. New York Life, along with Mainstay's family of mutual funds, offers investment and retirement solutions so you can help your clients keep good going. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally. Wintergreen, your home for global value. Rosalind P. Walter and the Fairhome Foundation.